นะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะบุตังธัมมังสังฆังนามสามิ The way it is, this word datada, or the what they called the what is the the takada, the thus one as is one, the way of pointing to the as is suchness. That there's no body, no person, that is, uh, in this conventional sense of a, of a personality, uh, the such, such one, or the as is one. In other words, this is the way it is. This being here is this way, as is, it is now. Now, using language in this way is kind of new, isn't it, for in the, in the English vocabulary, because English is a language that's very much talking about externals. Our language is very much uh, talking about uh, uh, the comparison, the dualism of the sensory experience. And language itself is, has that limitation. It, it can only take us that this far. And then, of course, we, when we attach to words, concepts, ideas, images, symbols, names, and forms, and all that, then we're stuck on that level as the sensory consciousness. We're just stuck with that. Stuck into it, bound to it. And whatever you bound to, you, you, because there's no self, then whatever you desire and you attach whatever desires there in the mind, you attach to it. You become that way. You know, so for us, life is a becoming. All the time, we're becoming that which we're attached to. And what becomes then goes to old age, sickness, death. Grief, sorrow, despair, lamentation, sokapariteva, tukatomanat, upayat. So that, that all of that is conditioned takes us only to despair and death. No desire takes us there, fear takes us there. It's a becoming. Um, and that's because of the, just the limitation of sensory consciousness. It can only be that way. It's not a transcendent kind of experience. It can only be the way it is. It's not that it's bad or wrong or that attachment to the senses is, is evil. It just means that attachment, if that's all we ever do, is attached to the sensory consciousness is that we end up feeling frightened and despairing. So it uh, sorrow and grief and lamentation, depression, all that is, is the result of attachment. And the Buddha pointed to that as a problem rather than than a belief in in immortality or in a in a, an absolute god or absolute power 
in these concept, conceptualizations of absolutes, metaphysics, the idea is that we can, we can imagine an absolute, can't we? We can imagine a God that is absolutely all-powerful, ultimately real, pervading everywhere, all loving, all compassionate, a jealous God, an angry God. We can imagine God being anything. The, I mean, the ability to make images, imagine and conceive God is is uh, very common to us. Or because of that, we tend to believe that there isn't any such thing. Which is another function of mind, isn't it? To deny and negate. Those are the two extremes. So the knowing that the, this negation and this affirmation are conditions of the mind. Because that is something you you can know directly. It's not taking sides, it's not it's not picking or choosing, it's noting and noticing and being aware, reflective on the way the way it is. Such as this. I do contemplations as, um, as is contemplations. This is the way it is. For example, sitting here and looking at this shrine. I listen to the sound of silence. Thinking process stops. Just sitting here, reflecting, noting. There's eye consciousness, isn't it? I'm looking at something. I'm not attaching to it in any way. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to call it anything. I don't have to criticize it or uh, compare it with other shrines or get lost in maybe because I really like it. It's the most absolutely fantastic shrine or, or maybe somebody, maybe I, I'm being critical of it. You can sit here and criticize it or praise it, give it all kinds of names, endlessly uh, think about it. But if I just become reflective on it, it's just as it is, it's just that way. Meaning that there's there's consciousness, but there's no there's no proliferation onto it. It's just this way. Then, as you abide in that stillness, and still, still your, your your attention is on the shrine. You you can give it a name. That's a Buddha rupa. Those are flowers. That comes. Those are the things that we we put onto it, isn't it? Those are the names the of our language, the sounds of our language that we we say Buddha rupa. If you said Buddha Rupa to many English people, they wouldn't know what that is, would they? But because we're Pali scholars, having spent the Vasa, diligently mastering the Pali language, you now know when I say Buddha Rupa, you know what that means, what that is. Flowers in Pali is Pupa. Thought of naming one of the new nuns. Pupa. <laughs> Flower. Then looking at those those new flowers, the bird of paradise reminds me of California. 
that uh, something that the memory paradise flowers so then reminded me of the bird of paradise flowers in my parents garden and of course my parents it goes on like that so the remembrance remembering one thing stimulates the, the mind and it goes on from one thing associations from one thing to another It's certainly things, it's just this way. There's no name for it. It is, it, it's, uh, 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 it, one needn't uh, analyze it, criticize it, compare it, but just abide with it. It's just the way it is. Unless there's a, a condition that arises, a situation where we need to call it something. Now just meditating in this way, we begin to to see that our lives are uh, so caught up in this endless proliferation. Ideas, views, opinions, names and forms and loves and hates and it goes on and on and on and on the mind. When you get angry, when you're angry with someone, you say somebody does something, I, I feel how dare they do that? And then immediately I start thinking, and last year they did did this, that really was upsetting to me last year, and the year before, and the year before that, and suddenly the whole associated connection, all of the bad things somebody's done, suddenly you just your mind is overwhelmed, you just have a total view, and somebody, uh, somebody else says, you say, and he did this, and then he did that, and then he did this, and he did that, and he didn't do this right, and he didn't say that in the right way, and it was making a problem here, and problem there. And then somebody says, well, you know, he, he remember that lovely gift he gave you last year on your birthday? Said, well, you know, he was just... <laughs> 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 because the good things you, you don't have room for in your mind when you're angry. You don't want to be reminded that they did anything ever any good in their lives. You just caught in that mode of negativity. So that that's proliferation, isn't it? Your mind just sinks into uh, and goes along in that rut. But in an empty mind, it's just suchness. If one suddenly feels an angry thing arising in one you're aware of it as that's the way it is but you don't proliferate on it so it ceases you don't give it you don't give it fertile you don't give it soil to grow in it if, if the impulse is there but you're cool enough clear enough not to to plant anything in it so nothing grows anger doesn't grow from there because you haven't planted anything into it. So that impulse, that moment of uh, impulsive anger ceases, it's gone. You've not acted or said anything from that position, so there's no karma made with it. It's just, it's just something that has arisen and ceased, such as it is, it's just that way. So the awakened one, the alert one, is just like that. And you, you know, take the position of the Buddha always, in these, like the Buddha Rupa. We sit like Buddhas, don't we? We try to sit like that. And that's a alert, a human being that's alert, awake, aware, knowing things as they are. <coughs> and when you, you can't, in murals, representations of Buddha at his enlightenment with all the forces of Mara tempting him 
because of the limitations of graphic art, you they have to put all these uh, forces of Mara as external forms because they can't fit it all inside the head of the picture of Buddha. You see, so that or in the, the body of the Buddha. They can't do that. So that they have it, all these like demons and angels and and all the, the whole gamut of the best to the worst and the kind of forces out there tempting. And the Buddha is a, such as this. It's a, There's suchness to the Buddha. Nothing. It's just this way. Demons, they don't, there's no name for them. They just... That's just the way it is. And so that is just like something arising in the mind and it ceases because it has no no way it can it can delude the Buddha. It's like if you suddenly feel an angry impulse, somebody says uh, steps on your toe with the big boots. I come along with those big boots Venerable Prabhaka gave me. And you're barefoot and I step on your toe. Crunch. And you think <laughs> that you th- an angry thought arises in your mind. A negative thought, isn't it? And you think, oh, I shouldn't think that. My meditation practice isn't good enough. If I can't, if I get angry with Venerable Tomato for breaking my feet, <laughs> or maybe that's a natural reaction a negative somebody hits you or harms you in some way the natural uh, uh, result of that is negative feeling feeling that, that's there but if you don't grasp that feeling it ceases it's not with physical pain that when you don't grasp it, it just as it's just as it is. It's just it's not it's uh, it's you you can't even call it pain. It's just the way it is. When you start calling it pain, then it begins to hurt. When you're really empty and alert, then and don't add anything, and just the suchness of of the of that feeling in the body. It's just that way. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no aversion that one is putting on to it. This is where to investigate, to to abide with these things, to to contemplate, to take the the pain, the anger, the sorrow, the depression, the desires, and all this. Use them for this reflection to say, this is the way it is. To really abide with it, bear with it, contemplate it. Now with impatience we think, oh I think I'll try that, maybe I'll get rid of the pain, maybe I'll get rid of this, maybe I'll get rid of that, I'll get rid of my anger, I'll get rid of my fears and desires. But they do what Venerable Sumedho says. So then you're taking what I say and but you're not really understanding what I'm saying because I'm asking you to be very, very patient and not ask to get rid of anything. Don't expect to, to get rid of things. Or if you do, note that as a condition you're creating. Waiting and hoping, doing something with the hope and expectation that you'll, it'll end, it'll cease and you'll, be able, and you'll feel a lot better. Because there's this hope an expectation that we'll come into here, sit down, go into a blissful state, just to be blissful, a state of tranquility, serenity, or bliss. That's what we'd like. We have light and and having wonderful feelings of love, universal love, and all that. We spend an hour in just a state of of loving everything. Instead. Sometimes we come in and we find this fidgeting, un- dreary, boring, boredom, weariness, sleepiness, restlessness, doubts, 
me. I've been working, trying so hard, and I can't. So then you add to that. I remember the insight into just mental confusion. I never, I always was resisting confusion, mental confusion, by trying to get rid of it. Now confusion, uh, what I use, mean by this word, is where many things are kind of going on at the same time, it seems. You know, there's so, so many kind of, kind of, there's nothing clear, nothing defined or definite or, or, you know, that you can really say this is it. It's just a kind of collection of all different, many different hazy, fuzzy things going on. You just feel terribly confused. And you're trying to kind of sweep away this web, web and cloudiness. So the resistance, trying to, to make clear by getting rid of the confusion. Then the realization that that one accepts the confusion, in to- just accept the total, the totality of confusion. It doesn't have to have any clear form. It can be just that way, just confusion in a kind of big mass of muddled mass like that. Just ac- accepting that rather than to try to figure out, make clear, and get it all clear and analyze it and and uh, clarify it and get rid of it, one will accept, as is the suchness of it, it's just this way. Now that's a, that, in that, in that acceptance of a big mass of confusion, you just totally, you're aware of it, you're, you're not trying to get rid of it, you're this, it's just as it is, and you you can just co- reflect on it, keep keep contemplating it's this way. You can see you can become aware of of uh, the desire to get rid of it, the impatience that it brings, the aversion or the fear or whatever that. It might it might be aroused from from having that in the mind. So then you accept the whole of it, the impatience, the confusion. So you're you what you're doing in this practice is is opening up to be greater than the than the condition. You're you're embracing, you're holding, you're supporting, taking, allowing this condition to be as it is. It's this way. Whatever arises, ceases. So you're in, out of this patience and acceptance, of course, you're letting it cease. You're allowing it to cease. And really, think about this. This is the way out of suffering. If you're constantly fighting with the conditions, it's just an endless kind of warfare, because one comes up and you, you may uh, get rid of it, and then you, another one comes up, and then you think you've gotten rid of that, and then the one that you thought you got rid of before comes back again, and you fight with that, and you manage to, to knock it down again, where you think it's gone, and then another one comes, and then you get exhausted, and you think, oh, I just, uh, can't meditate. Because all you're doing is battling with conditions. You're just creating problems, endless friction. So what might be confusing becomes more confusing. And just because you've, you've maybe gotten rid of it for a moment, it's the ostrich syndrome, isn't it? Or you're, uh, you're looking at the, at, uh, at the blue sky rather than at the ugly mess on the floor. You think, oh, beautiful blue sky. Or you're standing in a, in, a, in a mess. But when you're concentrated on the blue sky, you think, everything is fine. Everything is rosy. Everything is 
Every cloud has a silver lining. The sun is shining. Everything is wonderful. While you're standing in this muck and mire that you refuse to look at. Some people can do that. Other people live in, in absolute kind of sloppy, messy places. And just uh, looking at and it was so caught up in their own views and opinions that they don't even notice that they're living in a slum. Mentally, you know, this is, because of the of the lifespan of the human body, it means that we 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 have this this span of time to reflect in this way. You have a lifetime, because how long we might live is you know uncertain, but you can reflect that we have a lifetime within this form of the human being, and this allows us to to reflect on existence. We contemplate existence. What actually exists in the moment is this way. What, what, you're, what, it is, what there is in consciousness at this moment is what exists. We contemplate it. Now contemplation is, is, is that Function where of mind where we're we're noting, reflecting on something. And that's not an analysis, is it? We're not comparing and trying to find out anything about it and say it's its composition or its uh, history or any or any of the kind of worldly uh, attachments to it. But we are contemplating it. It's like you can contemplate this Buddha Rupa. I mean, you open your mind to it. It's in the mind now. It, it exists. It's just this way, such as it is. We're not saying it's beautiful, ugly, good or bad. Contemplate that it has a form and that there's a space around the form. We're not saying space around the form is good or bad, beautiful or ugly either. It's just this way. We can be aware of attraction or repulsion towards it. We have various habit tendencies. We might feel attracted or repelled by it. Or something might grab our attention, like those bird, the paradise flowers, the pupas. And we, we start saying, bird of paradise, I've given it a name. But actually it's just as it is. It, it doesn't, uh, it's, not, it's not saying to me, I'm, I am a bird of paradise. That's something I put onto it, isn't it? The Buddha Rupa is not saying, I am a Buddha Rupa made in Thailand. It's something that, that I put on to it. Because it's as it is. All its trees and flowers and mountains and everything is just as it is. And but we're, we're so conditioned to see these things through uh, views and opinions, through perceptions of them, that in this, in this contemplative way, we begin to get back to things as just as they are. We can still call them Buddha Rupas, but we're no longer attaching to that in, in, and, and proliferating onto that. We, needn't have, we don't have to have names for everything or know everything about everything. <coughs> Suddenly we feel quite willing to just be alert to things. Be alert to the way it is. Mm. 
<clears throat> so then, the conditions, the five aggregates, are just this way. They're just the way they are. They're not a person. They arise and cease. They're anicca, dukkha, nata. So they're just, the five kanas are this way, such as they are, as is. And so, so we're not creating. There's no sumato bhikkhu or anyone else. This is, this is just the way it is. Not creating a person out of it. But if I start attaching to perceptions and memories and all that of me as sumato bhikkhu or whatever, then, then of course I, I get carried away with proliferating. I've said this, this, this kanda sitting here right now, this way, I can think. And when I was ten years old, this happened to me. And my mother and my father, and when I was sixteen, and then when I was twenty-one, and then when I left the Navy, and then I went into university, whole history can go in front of my eyes, and there's this feeling of having of being some person through all that. And then we remember the the things we've done wrong, the mistakes we've made, the stupid things we've done and said. But actually, at this at this moment, if if, if in an empty mind, there's no Sumato Bhikkhu as such. Or Robert Jackman, or any anybody. It's just it's just this way, and those memories arise and cease in the mind. That's not a person. A memory is not a person, is it? It is a a memory has uh, of of Robert Jackman t- uh, twenty five years ago. There's nothing to it. It's just a, a soap bubble, isn't it? There's no blood, no nerves in a memory. There's no skeleton. Twenty-five years ago I had hair. Where's the hair? On the memory, hairy memory. Twenty. I had a moustache. I remember having a moustache. I used to wax it. It'd curl up on the end like Salvador Dali's. <laughs> Where is that? I wonder what happened to that moustache. attachment too because we are attached to memory we often are attached to the perceptions of being somebody with a family loved ones I reflect on my my parents I think where is my mother and father right now what well, what is that mother and father I think immediately I think of my mother if I say mother I think of I have the memory of what I call my mother, the memory. It's not my mother, is it? And if she's thinking of me right now, it's a memory of me. When she she remembers of me, I don't remember most of, of what she remembers of me. And if what if she described me, and what she remembers to you, if that were possible, she would you probably wouldn't recognize it as anything that you call Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> it's just it's just something else, isn't it? It's a memory. Something one remembers. So in this way of contemplating we 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 begin to free ourselves from this attachment to these strong emotional perceptions. 
they arouse all kinds of strong feelings. We we have so much uh, attachment and and uh, so much uh, habitual emotional uh, strong emotions in regards to things like mother and father, husband wife, children, relatives, friends, loved ones. You can make people cry when you say talk about your loved ones. Pray for our loved ones. And, our dear mother and dear father and then people start you can get people very emotional you can be you can go to a, a cinema you can be caught in the emotions of those people on a, those shadows on a screen and you don't even know them you don't they're nothing to you they're just mere kind of uh, there's just a, a story uh, of, on a film, shadows on the wall, and yet, the, as the as the hero embraces the princess, you know, that we can feel this tremendous kind of emotion rising. At last, they're together, happy. At last, they've met, and, he, and he's saying, "Darling, at last." We can be together forever. We need never separate again. And tears start falling out of your eyes. And she says, my hero. <laughs> <laughs> the eyes start welling up with moisture and emotion. What is that anyway? You know, even, you know, it's all false and acted out and you know, you probably if you've known any actors or actresses, while they're embracing each other in these incredibly romantic love scenes, oftentimes they're thinking something that we wouldn't want to know about. <laughs> no, it's a it's a magic show, isn't it? It's a it's all an illusion. And they, they, if you listen to music, you realize how emotional music is. So much of it is just a, a, a pull on the heartstrings. And suddenly, this music, and suddenly emotion starts rising up. And it's, that's, not, that's not a personal thing. It's, it's just the way it is. Emotions are like that. There's certain sounds and and all that that are uh, that bring up emotions. Those sentimental sounds and all the, these things that, that really draw on the feelings of one's you know, that one has. Now it's a condition, isn't it? We're conditioned creatures in that way. It's not a person. It's just the way it is. It's conditioned. We're conditioned to to respond in that way. Like the Pavlovian dog salivating when the bell rings. Now knowing that means that we, we can let it go. We, when, when we're aware of this, we needn't be just caught in a kind of being the programmed uh, kind of puppet, a robot, that where you push the buttons and you get this kind of response. They have a new term, and they say, pushing your buttons. I can make you happy or miserable according to what I say. If you're not mindful, I can, I can say something and you'll smile. <laughs> I say something and you'll get angry. How dare you? You can say, push your buttons. And a, a, a person, people can take advantage of you very easily just by pushing your buttons. So a heedless person is, is forever dying. Heedless person is always in this dying state. Is always, always trying to find something to get born into again and dying and then getting born again in just mental states because death is like, like 
the end of something, and so some some beautiful emotion arises, and then it dies in your mind. Then you want to get it again. The well, same with we we'll apply that to the the retreat here when you when you're trying to be reborn in that tranquil state that you enjoyed yesterday. Well, it, it die the the memory. It's a it's a memory now, so it's dead, and you're trying to revive it. You're trying to uh, uh, revive a, a corpse, something that's dead. It's happened already, but you remember it. So you're trying to to uh, revive it, resuscitate it. So you sit here and you're trying to, like trying to to uh, give artificial respiration to a corpse. So you don't get you don't get you just feel disappointed with it. Well, memories are corpses, aren't they? They're they're dead things. They're not. They just. They're all about what's happened, and they're dead. The Robert Jackman, with the Salvador Dali moustache, that is dead. It's a corpse. The the uh, yesterday is dead now. It's gone. It's died. Tomorrow hasn't been born yet, so it's unknown. And now is the knowing, you know, reflecting on that, being alert to the in the now. We're never born and never die. Appamado right? amatapadang. Mindfulness is the way to the immortal. Pamado machu no padang. Heedlessness is the way to death. Appamado namianti. Mindfulness is never dying. Ye pamada ya tamata. And heedlessness is dying. Is just like dying. Is the same as dying all the time. So people that are heedless are always in depressions, elations. They're, they're, they're the great sufferers of life because they're heedless and they're always dying, they're depressed, dying, death, meaningless, boredom, weariness, sadness, despair, grief, lamentation. <laughs> the whole gamut of misery is from heedlessness. Now you can't be mindful of yesterday, can you? And you can't be mindful of tomorrow. So where can you be mindful? Now, isn't it? They'll be mindful tomorrow. I'll be heedless today and mindful tomorrow. They don't bother me with your meditation. I'll, I can, I'll, be, I'll be mindful tomorrow. Right now, let me be heedless. Because we think of heedlessness as uh, well, we we wouldn't think of heedlessness, but we think of doing what, following every impulse, and and doing what we want, and indulging in this, and denying that, and so forth. As we're so used to that, we think that that is a lot of fun, or we we long to to continue in that way sometimes, because to be mindful means to let things die, rather than to seek rebirth all the time. To be mindful means you're letting things die away, you're letting things end, rather than running after things, trying to get reborn again. And yet that the paradox is always that running after things is dying. Running after things, trying to get reborn again, is forever dying. And mindfulness, where you're letting everything die, is a, but with the mindfulness you're letting everything die. You're allowing it to cease and end. And therefore there's no death. There's only the, the ending of what is not self. It's just the allowing, living in harmony with the, with the way it is. 
when you're not living in harmony, then you're always grasping, you're trying to hold on to this and make it last longer than it should. You're trying to get rid of that and make it and get and make it die before it's ready to. And so you're always in this state of of agitation, controlling, manipulating things. And that is forever dying. It's like dying all the time. You're always it's always frustrating and irritating and despairing. because you're in constant kind of frantic agitation. So instead, you're letting things die. Right now, this is as it is. What arises, ceases. Now tomorrow, since you all uh, were so good about getting up at three o'clock in the morning, And uh, I know you leapt out of your beds with alacrity. Uh, so I want to encourage you to do that again tomorrow morning. Really put forth that, that effort to get up. Three, not to give it a second thought. To avow firmly in your mind to to get up at three o'clock, at least when the sound of the bell, and the, the the more skilled ones will get up before that, the stupid ones will just lay there and give it second thought or just try to ignore it. Now this is this to for you to to take on that responsibility to try your to to be sincere in trying to to live by the standard that has been established just to to do that to be obedient and surrender to it rather than do things half heartedly resentfully and with resistance willing to sacrifice and let go of things just to to be in harmony with that just to try it out to give it a chance to develop it to be patient with it rather than to do it half-heartedly resentfully or not do it and just see what you can get away with because it's you that have to live with yourself and uh, it's 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 the kind of mind that if you if you keep doing things with without real earnestness and sincerity and do things just half-heartedly and resisting and and uh, that then you're you're going to have to remember that you're going to have to bear with all that you don't have a a, a mind that is bright and clear and and alert to things and learn from life quickly. You're going to have to learn, take a long time to learn things. You're going to, it's going to be very painful because it takes so long. If you're stubborn and resistant and indulgent and all that, then it, it takes so long, such a long time to get over it. But the more you, you notice people that don't have that kind of pride or stupidity in them. They learn very, very quickly. Wisdom comes very quickly to them. Stubbornness and pride are very great, are great uh, uh, obstacles. And don't, uh, if you're sleeping in the in the dormitory, don't worry about what if, if others don't do it. Don't don't follow that. The bad examples of others. If you see an anagarika who's setting a good example, then follow that. Be like that. But if 
you're just following the, the kind of heedless, indulgent ones. Notice how, like the cigarette smokers, all gather together. And one monk once told me had a cigarette had would like to smoke cigarettes, and he said. I've always admired Venerable Sujito and Venerable Amaro. But he said, I can't be like them. I hang out with the ones that smoke cigarettes. <laughs> it's still, still half hearted, isn't it? They're feeling guilty all the time. Remember, you can. You, you don't have to be that way. You can not do that. And you keep. Keep affirming that. One thing I found in, in the monastic life before I ordained, I thought, so many that I thought celibacy would be impossible. I actually did. I thought I never could probably manage that. I found out uh, not a problem. I thought giving up smoking would be impossible because I tried so hard before and always failed. I found once I determined, and I just kept going with it. Stopping. And kind of, and if I <clears throat> started again, then I'd stop again. I keep, keep at it, like gnawing away at things till I, till I broke through and and succeeded with it. But if if not, then one's always been, this kind of always uh, lagging behind, half-heartedly on the edges, on the fringes. In, in um, spiritual life, we need to be very sincere in what we're doing, very honest, and willing to sacrifice anything, everything. So that's a, that's uh, the ideal. So then work at that with just little things. Like now I'm emphasizing this getting up immediately at three o'clock in the morning. So that that's not asking a tremendous amount, like total self-sacrifice and life commitment. Monk forever. Total life commitment to to celibacy and Manas and Padimokha discipline, it's just, it's what? It's asking you to get up at three o'clock in the morning without giving it a second thought. And if you give it a second thought, then don't give it a third. 